in, in their Zur and Raqqa where, where Daesh imposed itself. Now, maps, regardless of all that, <coughs> the social basis of the re regime and the demogra demography supporting the regime was becoming more and more tired with the war. By 2015, with all those uh, complications and lack of international political investment in Syria, lack of initiatives, uh, there was a UN initiative in Geneva bringing uh, some representatives of the regime and of different opposition groups to talk about uh, a possible constitution, reconciliation, ending the conflict. All of that is, is agonizing, in fact, is not progressing. But on the ground, the regime is losing control over more and more territory. And by summer 2015, the regime controlled only between 18 and 20 percent of Syria mainly Damascus, the area around Damascus, and all the areas close to the Lebanese borders, plus the, the coast, the Mediterranean coast, where is the majority of the Alawite community that Assad was trying to mobilize it as much as possible and connecting uh, his own destiny to the destiny of the whole community. And when it comes to the Lebanese borders, that was strategic for the Iranians and Hezbollah, not to lose that area because this is the connection between Syria and Lebanon for the weapons, for uh, strategic consideration. And they kept as well a kind of a corridor connecting that area to Iraq. Uh, because Iran, if you look at the map, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, they needed a territorial continuity. And that's why Hezbollah's efforts were mainly around Damascus and around the Lebanese border. But that was not enough anymore. So the Iranians did negotiate as of March 2015 until June 2015 with the Russians uh, on a possible Russian intervention to save a regime that the Iranians said we cannot continue anymore. Because uh, uh, at the time, we were not going into all details, but Iran brought not only Hezbollah that was securing, let's say, the, the part in Syria that is close to the Lebanese borders, but they brought as well Iraqi militias. They then brought Hazara from Afghanistan and refugees in Iran uh, militia, then there will be Pakistani militia, uh, Zainab Iyun, the, Iraq, the Iraqis, you have many, from Asaib Ahl al-Haq to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas to al to many, many groups, and from the Hazara, the Fatim Iyun, uh, they brought them and they were supporting uh, Assad, plus there was a kind of decentralization of the security machine of the regime by allowing local militias, pro-regime, in the Alawite areas, in uh, some of the Christian areas, and in many other uh, places uh, to, uh, to emerge and to control the ground so that the army of the regime that is losing man and cannot recruit anymore could be on the fronts with the militias that Iran uh, brought. And this is what will lead finally in September to uh, a Russian intervention in Syria, a Russian uh, intervention that will, in a way, show that overthrowing Assad is not possible anymore. It became uh, an illusion to consider after the Russian intervention that militarily on the ground we can overthrow Assad. Okay. And gradually, in fact, the Russian intervention will allow Assad to uh, start seizing the territories that uh, his regime lost during the four, four previous years, uh, moving from around 20% to what is today uh, between 60 and uh, 62, 63% of the territory of Syria with all major cities under its control. And that was one objective, is to have urban Syria under the control of, of the regime and to keep a divided, fragmented rural Syria outside the control of the regime if uh, he cannot uh, seize it back. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, the war that Russia will lead, two years later we will see its impact after seizing back eastern Aleppo after taking over the Wuta and Dara'a, uh, ending with uh, Homs before and then with northern Hama uh, pushing away any threat on the city, uh, plus their Zur. So the regime would connect most of its cities, uh, except for Idlib and, and Raqqa as, as uh, important cities, uh, will, will control them. And in between, uh, due to the fact that the Kurdish militias supported by the Americans were fighting Daesh on the ground, there would be an expansion of the Kurdish territory uh, or, the, or the Kurdish uh, territorial control that pushed in 2016 Turkey to intervene directly after being indirectly behind some of the opposition groups. So by 2018 and after the two summers of 17 
18, uh, by uh, March 2019, because this is when Trump uh, declared the war on Daesh as mission accomplished. Since that time, we have a kind of a statu quo. It's not always 100% uh, the same map. Sometimes there are a few clashes here and there that might change part of the control uh, in this territory or the other. But in general, the map is the same since 2018. Uh, the regime controls 60% now or a bit more of the territory. The Kurdish militias supported by the uh, Americans uh, control around 20 to 25%. Uh, and then you have 10 to 12% in two different enclaves controlled by uh, the oppositions, uh, one of them directly supported by Turkey, the other by the Americans in the south. We'll see it on the map. Uh, and you have the Russian army, the Iranian forces, and the series of militias they brought. Uh, you have the American army, you have the Turkish army, and you have regularly uh, Israeli airstrikes on Hezbollah's bases and on uh, Iranian convoys uh, in Syria. So a country with different occupation forces So this is the, the map now of the control. Uh, you can see it. In, in red, you have the regime, the Russians, the Iranians, and their allies. Uh, in green, you have the oppositions. Uh, when I say the oppositions, it's, uh, that's what we talk about it. It's also rival groups. They're not like in a unified camp. So you have here in the tenth area a uh, military bases with some refugees living around it and uh, supported by the Americans. In that area, uh, some forces of the opposition were trained exclusively or only to fight ISIS when ISIS existed, and they refused. They said they want to fight the regime and ISIS. So their mission was put on hold. And since that time, they have been in that basis. Sometimes they are attacked by Iranian drones. Uh, sometimes um, nothing happens, and the Americans retaliate to uh, um, bomb the Iranian militias. But this is an area controlled by, by the opposition. And that area in the north, where you have as well al-Nusra or Fath al-Sham, uh, former al-Qaeda in Idlib, and different groups of oppositions in the other part, uh, directly supported by Turkey. In this area, sorry, in this area, you have the Turkish army uh, present as well. While what is in yellow is the Kurdish-controlled territory uh, with American bases and few uh, special forces, I think, from France and Britain. And you have as well camps in this area of the families of former Daesh fighters who were killed or captured by, by the Kurdish militias or by the uh, Western allies. And that is a big issue, whether they should return, not return. I think in different uh, European countries the debate exists, and each uh, country adopted a different uh, approach to it. So uh, a fragmented country, an occupied country, uh, and at the same time, the destructions in Syria, that's why I said at the beginning it's a laboratory. Maybe now in Gaza the destructions are more important. The intensity of the bombing is, is much higher and uh, the space is much smaller. But uh, what um, they called in, in French herbicide, herbicide, we can say it, yeah, they, they, this herbicide, uh, whether in Aleppo, whether in Homs, uh, uh, whether in some other places, the amount of destruction that you see was clearly also on purpose uh, to displace people, to make it impossible for them to return, because the question of the refugees and the question of the displacement was a policy, was a demographic policy based on sectarian or confessional lines. And Assad did not hide it in two occasions when he mentioned that the Syrian social fabric or social tissue is much better now, when he said that uh, uh, those who left well, they, they, uh, they, he did not say they cannot return, but uh, he said that the country uh, is much better now and is more homogeneous uh, after their departure. Plus, he refused their return during the process of normalization with Saudi Arabia uh, recently, after the normalization with the United Arab Emirates uh, and Bahrain. Uh, the three also who uh, normalized at the same time uh, with Israel their uh, relations. Now, 
Um, what I said at the beginning about this laboratory, in, additional, in addition to the math and to the layers that, uh, that we saw, um, with, with a conflict that had many wars at the same time. There is a kind of uh, Kurdish, Arab tribes war in the East. There are wars between many opposition groups. There are rival groups loyal to the regime. There is a war between the regime and the oppositions. There is a war between uh, Russia and uh, Iran on the one hand, uh, opposing them to the opposition. There were clashes between Turkey and Russia, and then they reconciled. There are clashes between Turks and Kurds that are negotiated regularly by the Americans and the Russians in order to contain them. Uh, Israel bombs Hezbollah, and sometimes Hezbollah retaliates. Uh, so you have different conflicts taking place at the same time. And the national cause of the Syrians, in that sense, got lost. Uh, it did not disappear, it did not vanish, but it, lost, it, it was lost in between all those ongoing uh, conflicts uh, and, and struggles on the Syrian land. Uh, it became an incarnation of the UN inability to deal with the situation, 14 vetoes. Sometimes uh, some diplomats say that the vetoes were not that bad because if there was no veto, we need to be able to impose what the UN res resolution might stipulate. So in some cases, it was not like a terrible arrangement even for Western powers who were uh, protesting against the Russian uh, use of, of veto. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, inability of dealing with the conflict and, and the fact that it uh, kept evolving one year after the other created uh, questions and, and problems uh, that we will live with for a long period of time. Definitely, we cannot explain the Russian war in Ukraine based on the Syrian model, for sure. There are historical uh, uh, contexts and, and reasons for the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. But if Russia was not allowed to intervene the way it did in Syria, I'm not sure the, the same configuration uh, in, in the invasion of Ukraine would have happened. Uh, Syria allowed Russia to feel much more uh, confident in its aggressive policy and made its invasion of Ukraine, I think, more possible. The other thing is that the refugee crisis did lead in some places to, to hysteria, uh, not only in Europe, by the way, in Lebanon also, uh, in Turkey uh, in, in the last few years also. But parts of the reasons of this hysterical rise of the far right in many places is related to migration and refugees, and for sure, the Syrian crisis and the millions of Syrian refugees, in a way, uh, were part of, of the reasons of that, uh, which means that leaving a country, abandoning a country, and allowing a regime and some forces to displace people the way this happened without any intervention also had consequences elsewhere uh, in Europe, around the Mediterranean, and in the neighboring countries where uh, racism, crisis, uh, uh, instrumentalization of the misery of the refugees are now parts, characteristics of the domestic uh, uh, political scenes. Uh, and of course, Syria is given an example now in the Arab world. Whoever speaks again about revolution, revolutionary attempts, revolutionary aspirations, democratic transition, ah, you want to become like Syria? Exactly as a few years before, we used to say, ah, you want to become like Iraq? or like Libya at the beginning of the revolutions. So Syria became a kind of a model, a kind of an example given always. You want Syria or stability even if under a dictator. You want uh, Syria and becoming a refugee, uh, or you accept uh, Sisi or uh, Saeed, or, 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 or many examples can be given. And, and of course, uh, Gulf countries use that example on many occasions as well, uh, promoting what they call stability rather than what revolutions uh, create in terms of instability. So the counter-revolutionary model took Syria as an example and built on it to end with any democratic aspiration, even if that did not really work well. Because remember 2019, Sudan, Iraq, Lebanon, and Algeria, a second phase or a second wave of Arab revolutions. But once again, they were defeated, like most of the previous ones. Uh, they were defeated, but it showed that the story is not over in a way, that there are still uh, dynamics and, and there are still uh, factors 
that might bring people again to the streets, even if mm, two defeats and then the second defeat immediately after it, COVID and, and all the, the crisis that followed, and then the collapse of the Lebanese economy, and then the civil war in Sudan, mm, it's not encouraging anymore. Uh, but we, we will see how things uh, evolve. For now, we can say that that revolutionary model was defeated, but maybe it's not like a final defeat or a definite defeat. Uh, Syria became a <coughs> laboratory of violence. I think this is the most documented conflict in history. Uh, we've seen almost everything. Sometimes the criminals themselves filmed what they did. We don't know if they did it in order to frighten the others, in order to be proud about what they did. I think you also recently in The Guardian, uh, the films that were uh, brought from uh, Tadamun massacre, uh, where they are laughing while asking people to run and then shooting them and then burning them. Uh, there are tens of videos, if not hundreds of videos like that, filmed by the killers, uh, the perpetrators themselves. Uh, plus you have lots of statistics about all airstrikes. Uh, there are lots of uh, satellites as well, filming all the time, showing all the time. Uh, there were some alerts about that a possible airstrike would take place here, would take place there, based, based on the itinerary or trajectory of it. So it is extremely well uh, documented. Uh, and that might be a, a basis, not only for a historical archive, but also a good basis for later uh, judicial procedures, uh, maybe some uh, investigations. We'll see and we'll talk about it at the end. But this is the most uh, documented uh, conflict. And the philosophy of violence uh, of the regime is not like just it's a war and everything is allowed. No. There were clear messages through the violence. Uh, for instance, uh, not giving the, the families, the bodies of their beloved ones who were killed under torture or uh, who were just killed and their bodies were taken is not something that um, because of lack of administrative uh, capacities. No, it is not to allow them to turn pages, uh, to consider that they can go on. It's to keep them suspended in time, always waiting, always paralyzed. It's a way of paralyzing a whole society. And that's why there are still more than 100,000 people in jail in Syria under the regime control. Why would they release them? They're not anymore a threat. The regime is not threatened anymore with the Russians. To keep them is also to paralyze, to paralyze millions of people, relatives, friends, families, who don't want to talk about them. No, they talk about them. There's an economy that has been built, a mafia economy. I pay people money to get some information. And in many cases, the information are, are wrong. They're just lies. They're taking the money. Or I pay someone money so that uh, they will treat my uh, brother or my father or my son a bit better. They will give him some better food. They send food sometimes. And many people are still in Damascus. They don't want to leave because they hope that one day maybe he is alive, maybe she is alive. So that kind of paralyzing a society is not just uh, an arbitrary violence. It's a well thought and planned violence, exactly as the destruction of all suburbs of cities. Uh, with the idea of one day reconstructing these areas with a different economic model for other social classes and maybe for people from other communities as well in a sectarian system and in a sectarian uh, regime approach. Uh, the, the other issue is allowing people to steal what they call, the Syrians call, ta'fish, from afish, which means the furniture, meaning seizing the furniture taking what is so intimate, and the idea of not only destroying the public space where you can live, but I will also destroy your private place. I will seize all your memories, all whatever uh, you lived with, uh, you, the furniture, your pictures, and I will sell them in markets that were called the Sunni market, Suq Sunnah, in some cities, in order to create more sectarian anger and hatred and to divide the society even more. So this is also a well-thought uh, policy. The question of imposing sieges. I don't know if you uh, saw pictures from the Yarmouk Palestinian refugee camp, or from the Uta of Damascus, or from many other places, besieging people without a military, in fact, need, because the balance of power is, is so clear, uh, and, and they have uh, the Air Force, and they have the Russians. But it is also to keep in their mind forever that they suffered hunger, that they were uh, uh, suffocating under the siege, that the regime can uh, do whatever 
uh, it, it wanted to do with them, that their lives were just a matter of a decision, and to keep it 